In or out, for the next five years, Britain's future in the European Union could be shrouded in uncertainty, thanks to David Cameron's commitment to a referendum. He believes his dramatic gamble will pay off not just at home, but in Europe too, allowing him to recalibrate Britain's relationship with Brussels. But will it work? My guest today, Sir Nigel Scheinwald, was the UK's top diplomat at the EU, foreign policy advisor to Tony Blair, and then ambassador in Washington. Is the Cameron EU gambit in Britain's national interest? Sir Nigel Scheinwald, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. You, in the recent past, have been foreign policy advisor to a British Prime Minister, not David Cameron. In fact, it was Tony Blair. But had David Cameron had you next to him, foreign policy advisor, and he had said to you, Nigel, I am going to go for this in-out referendum on Britain's future in Europe, what would you have said to him? Well, I think as a professional advisor, um, I would have said that I can see the attractions uh, in some way if Britain emerges from this more committed to the European Union and with a more settled uh, position within it. But I think I would also have said that it's a, um, it's a long way to go and a very difficult road that you've chosen because um, there are fundamental problems of negotiability um, and of uncertainty that are associated with the, with the move that the Prime Minister announced yesterday. But do you accept uh, the contention that Cameron makes, the context he puts to this, which is, in his view, that disillusion, public disillusion in the UK with the EU is at an all-time high, and that consent for membership of the European Union is, in his words, wafer thin? Well, I'm, he's certainly right that public disillusion with the European Union is higher in the UK than it's been. Now, what are the factors within that? Is it only about the European Union? Um, is it more to do with the general state of politics, the general state of our uh, economy? After all, the measures which um, were announced here, our austerity measures, have nothing to do with the euro, nothing to do with, uh, with Brussels. These are uh, measures which our government and our parliament have enacted. You're sort so, of implying the public has got it wrong. No, I'm not implying they've got it wrong. I'm saying there's a tangle of issues that are normally at the root of most of these opinion polls. If you do accept the contention that, that disillusion with the EU in, in Britain is at an all-time high, is it not a terrible indictment of, of policymakers, the people at the centre of the policymaking establishment who for years have conducted Britain's foreign policy toward the EU without consulting the British public. And I would include you in those who <laughs> face this indictment. Well, I don't, I, I don't think that is fair because um, at every stage of our um, involvement in Europe, um, our parliament, uh, our ministers have been involved. We did have a referendum, as you know, in 1975 um, about yeah, the basic uh, terms. A referendum which nobody under the age of 50-something can, can possibly remember and yes. so didn't participate in. But there are very few major public policy issues on which we have running referenda in this country, whether it's about the running of our economy, the fundamentals of our international relations, the big moral um, and social issues of our time. That isn't how we do it in this country normally. They, those are reserved for special moments where a fundamental change in but the constitutional relationship in the UK is yes, being considered. It, it gets down to this key question of Britain's constitutional place in Europe. And let us not forget that your former boss, the man you advised for years, Tony Blair, did indicate he was willing to contemplate a referendum as Europe looked to create a new constitution in the early 2000s. You appeared to be supportive of that. In the end, it became very complicated. We ended up with the Lisbon Treaty. But Britain and the British people never had that vote that Blair had pointed towards. No, but the argument for that, and uh, you, know, you can go over the past history, but the reason... Well, do you think was it was a mistake now? In all honesty, was it a mistake? I personally wouldn't have advised him to do it, but, the, um, but that's not the issue. The, he felt it was necessary to do it because in the Constitution there was a big constitutional leap forward, and that necessitated a further consultation of the British people. The issue today is um, whether that is going to be the case. If David Cameron uh, achieves his objectives 
um, uh, as he discussed them in his speech, then in fact there would be a transfer back to Britain um, of powers. It wouldn't be a ratcheting up of further European power against us. But that was the rationale for doing it over the European Constitution a few years ago. The problem is that when you and other people who, if I can put it this way, are, just, uh, are, are pro European and deeply committed to Britain's place in the European Union. When you talk of the dangers of a referendum and how unwise it might prove to be, you sound as though you are running scared of this basic consultation with the British voters. I haven't actually said so far, Stephen, that I'm against a well, referendum. Well, you counted it very carefully, what I, but you stressed to me what how I, difficult and how unwise it might be. What I've said is that the, the first issue is about the negotiability of what uh, the UK wants to do. And that's what the Prime Minister has to consider, first of all, um, is whether he's able to achieve the goals that he set out, whether um, the significant new settlement that he's after of transfer of powers back to the UK, a fundamental reform of our role in Europe, whether that is achievable in the time well, frame that he's talked about. With your experience of Brussels politics, is it achievable? I think that he was very wise not to give us a laundry list um, in his speech of the different things that he wanted at this stage and reserve that for later when he knows the context a little bit better. But I think it's going to be very difficult to achieve what he's set out so far. Why? because the rest of the European Union has got to play as well. When you're in uh, a negotiation of 27, everyone wields a veto. Everyone's got a gun in the room. Uh, it's not as though we're the only ones who have domestic politics and domestic constituencies to look after. So you have to respect the position that what emerges has to be in the general interest uh, of our partners. They have to assent to what we want, just as we have to assent to what they want when you're looking, about, when you're looking at constitutional well, change. All of that is undoubtedly true. The question is how the balance of power sits within that negotiation. Seems to me, when you say how difficult it's going to be, you're assuming that, that the cards are held predominantly by the other member states of the EU rather than Britain. Seems to me Britain holds a substantial number of cards as well. No, we do. And, uh, and I start from the position that, that all our partners, and uh, that certainly includes the most important of them, France, Germany, and the other major countries in Europe, I start from the position that they want us to stay in and will go some way to meet our concerns. Yeah, and, and Angela what, Merkel's already said she wants exactly to talk about it, she's looking for compromise, and she has not in any sense at all, sounded rejectionist no. or negative about what Cameron said. Exactly. And I, and I would say that is exactly what I would expect. But she said that there have to be a compromise, and, and that's what I would expect from the other parties. And I think that the one point you've got to bear in mind is that they will judge this according to their national interest and their national economic interest. And at the moment, that's bound up with the survival of the euro. They will want to do nothing which undermines the recovery of the eurozone economy or unravels the core of the single market that we're talking about is the thing that well, we most want to belong to. Sure, as you know, Cameron's far from unraveling the single market, wants to strengthen the single market. That, that's the premise upon which he bases Brit British membership of the European Union. But the issue for the others is how you can do that and at the same time be talking about bringing back to the UK powers which, which a number of our partners would say are inextricably connected to the good functioning of the single market. Well, you know, uh, opponents of the Cameron position do seem to believe it will be terribly difficult to negotiate powers back to Britain. Let me just quote to you something that the Europe Minister of Finland, who happens to have written a PhD on the variety of different relationships member states have with, with Brussels and the, the European Union, uh, this is what he said just after Cameron spoke. He said, look, we all need Britain in Europe. Cameron's move clarifies the debate. It was gutsy. And he said, to be quite honest, there's a lot of differentiation inside the EU. Look at the euro. Look at Schengen. Look at defense arrangements. We have to stick to the bulk of EU integration but we can take a few raisins out of the bun. Yes. That's what Cameron wants, isn't it? Well, is it, though? I mean, I think if, it, if it's... Um, in the past, there's no doubt that we've got a certain accommodation from our partners. You're absolutely right. We got the opt-out from the uh, uh, Economic and Monetary Union. We got actually a social opt-out, which lasted until the Labour government came in in 97. Um, and we have an opt-out on Schengen. We have an opt-out, essentially, on Justice and Home Affairs. We can decide what we want to do there. Our partners have recognized over the past 20 years that Britain, because of its legal system, 
system, because of its history, is in a different position. We've got a, a huge amount of flexibility already. The question is whether you can carry on chipping away at that or whether you're starting to reach the bare bone of what is the, the core of the single market. So I think it's perfectly reasonable for us to put down our proposals and we will undoubtedly get something out of that sort of global negotiation. And surely the it concentrates the minds of all those in the room much more uh, effectively to say that if we don't get what we want or pretty close to it, there is the option for Britain to leave the Union, which no other serious leader of the European Union wants to see happen. Yes, I, I, I wonder about the psychology. I think for some that might, that might work in our favour in the way you've suggested. For others, if they see um, an ineluctable path to us leaving, they'll wonder what's the incentive for them of trying to work with us. And some people will be irritated by, um, by having, a, having a gun pointed at their heads and our heads. You very carefully avoided absolutely categorically saying to me that you believe this referendum is a mistake but there are many who have said that and the thing they point to more than anything else is this idea there is going now going to be up to five years of massive uncertainty in the relationship between Britain and Europe but the fact is is it not that the uncertainty is there anyway because of all the factors we've already discussed about the state of British public opinion what Cameron is promising to do is give a finite end to the uncertainty well, you can put it that way. I mean, I think that the, um, the fact is that five years is a long time. Um, it's a time in which our economy is going to be... Well, otherwise uh, it's open-ended. Five years is probably better than open-ended, is it? Well, but then the alternative might have been to have waited until after the election, to have seen whether there was going to be a huge global discussion about further integration in Europe, onto which we could have bolted um, a set of British demands for change, um, and to see where we were after that. But we've, we've extended the time. There's nothing we can do about that now. We're in that position. But I don't think you can deny that it will create an uncertainty in relation to inward investment to the UK and about our position in Europe and therefore our position in the world. That's why the rest of the world is watching intently. Um, they're not indifferent to what's going on here. No, indeed. But uh, the other uh, argument which you make, I think, because you're now involved with a, a, a lobby group which promotes business in Europe, the other argument is that, you know, inward investment simply won't become because of this uncertainty and that, that Britain will, become, will lose out in terms of investment, in terms of growth, in terms of jobs because of the political situation we find ourselves in today. How do you explain that 55 of the most senior businessmen in the UK have just written a letter to the newspaper saying that is categorically not true and that what Cameron has done will actually end up being good for British business because it focuses minds on making the EU more open, more competitive, more business friendly. Everyone agrees with that and uh, you know, all the business organisations want to see less red tape, they want to see a greater focus on the single market, a greater focus on international competitiveness. That goes without saying. Well, hang on a minute, it doesn't go out without saying from you because you sat in meetings for years in Brussels where you signed up to more and more red tape. No, we, we, we certainly didn't. We, we might have signed well, up uh, to... How come we are members of a union which we, say, we now say is dysfunctional unless people like you agreed to the measures that are currently in place. Parliaments like ours, elected governments like ours, agreeing to, agreeing to things which bring advantage to the UK. But which we sometimes now say are dysfunctional. We well, now say we are in a union which operates I don't in think a way it, I don't that think is it, not acceptable. Well, I don't think it is dysfunctional. It's got a series of problems. But, but which everybody says this. I mean, not just David Cameron who wants a referendum, but Ed Miliband and Nick Clegg who don't want this referendum at this particular time also say the EU needs fundamental reform. And if it needs fundamental reform, it just leaves the question in my mind why diplomats like you signed up to all of the arrangements that we now see in the first place. Governments and parliaments sign up to the arrangements and people negotiate them. Um, and in the, U and in the you European... People like you. Of course. And did you and make some mistakes? I don't know whether I made mistakes or not, well, but you, I know... You can now analyse the EU that you helped to create, and do you think it is dysfunctional? No, I don't think overall it's dysfunctional. I think that it requires reform, but I think overall it continues to bring advantage to the UK. And the European Union that we've created over the past 20 years... Just let me finish. Um, in relation to the euro, of course, has not worked out. But the UK um, had an opt-out for that, and that protected our position completely. Yeah, but it's the not single, just that. The single market's advanced, Stephen. We've achieved an objective of widening the European Union and bringing the uh, countries of Central and Eastern European I uh, Union in. These are huge advantages for Britain, not to be, not to be uh, disregarded or regarded as trivial. Well, my, my, my opinion doesn't matter, but the opinion of, of business people matters. I mean, Luke Johnson, one of the most uh, sort of influential private equity specialists in the UK says, from his analysis, 
Far from creating jobs, the EU, with all of its red tape, regulation and everything else, working time directives, the lot, he says it destroys jobs. And he also adds the idea that, that we wouldn't trade with the EU if we weren't part of it is just, in his words, a joke. They would want to trade with us, but what position would we be in? That there are a couple of models for countries which have very close relationships with the European Union, but which are not inside it. They're Norway and they're Switzerland. And in neither case does those countries have any say in the regulations which they take on in order to be part of, in Switzerland's case, some parts of the single market, in Norway's case, all parts of the single market. So is that what we want for the UK, that we'll be receiving um, uh, the, uh, the, the rules, the single market rules, as the Prime Minister said, by fax from Brussels? I don't think we want that. So, so staying in... Uh, is very important. That's what the Prime Minister is after, after all. He, yes, it he's is, talking but, but he's about not saying that he will stay in at any cost. Are you saying that you can imagine no circumstances in which you might conclude it would be better for Britain to leave than stay in? I, I would say for myself that I can see no circumstances in which it would be to our overall advantage to be out. But I can see that the pathway that the Prime Minister has set out could, in certain extreme circumstances, lead to that. And if that happened, Britain's negotiators would do their best in that situation. But the prospects of us being able to dip into the single market from the outside if we'd basically decided we were going to stay out are not terribly good. A final point uh, on this debate, and it, it comes back to something I mentioned earlier about some of those opposed to the idea of a referendum, looking as though they're running scared of democracy. You've talked about the danger of Britain heading for the exit by accident, yes. as though you believe a referendum could somehow produce a situation in which the British electorate somehow accidentally votes for an exit. And to me, that sounds like a very patronising view of the UK public's ability to make sense of this entire argument. No, that's not what, I, not what I said. What I said was that the, um, that the debate is should be a full one. The more people know about the European Union, I think, the more, um, the more pro-European they're likely to be. There's been more of a debate, actually, in the last couple of months. That's you look and, at and actually, the polls look, at the moment, the last set of polls looking at the in-out debate suggest that, frankly, a majority may be there for staying in. That's what I was going to say. Which is another reason so, to say, why be so cautious about the notion I'm cautious of... of of for the reasons I've given, five years of uncertainty, five years of a chilling effect on inward investment, five years of questioning uh, where we're going to end up in the end, there is a very significant possibility that we might not stay in. We'll have to see. It depends a little bit on how um, the government of the day were to get on in any negotiation. And about that, I'm concerned. I don't think it'll be uh, a cakewalk by any means for us to achieve really major objectives of the kind the Prime Minister set out. So there are a series who, who would, of risks. Uh, just on a final uh, detailed point about that, who given your very recent knowledge of European diplomacy, who do you think would be the main uh, obstacle, the main blocking voices to Cameron getting what he wants? It seems to me the Germans and certainly the Scandinavians, the Czechs and a few others are, are, are up for it. Who do you think is going to be the biggest hurdle? Well, I think when it comes to it, um, quite a few of them would be concerned about anything which unpicked the single market in a radical way. So it depends what we put down. Um, if the other members of the European Union are saying, for us in the Eurozone, we want another great leap of um, integration, we want to change the fundamental treaties of the European Union, have major constitutional reform, that provides um, a platform for, for the UK to put forward a bigger package. But say they don't do that, but say they decide they can do most of what they need in terms of Eurozone governance um, through smaller measures without changing the fundamentals of the EU. In that circumstance, I think we'll look rather high and dry with a very, very big package of our own. So I think it depends a bit on the context in Europe. This will be known after the European elections next year. I want to change the, the, the context a little bit and talk about the United States. You, till very recently, were British ambassador in Washington. Were you surprised that, that Philip Gordon, Assistant Secretary of State, came to London and made it very plain, speaking on behalf of President Obama, that the United States regarded it as a, an important national interest for the United States that Britain remain inside the European Union? And to quote Phil Gordon, that referendums have often turned countries inward. It was a blatant intervention in British 
political debate, wasn't it? I wasn't surprised that he said that the U.S. interest, the American interest, is that Britain should be an active and influential member of the European Union. I think that's been the American position for a very long time. I think it's the position of the previous Republican administration as well as the present um, Democratic administration. But so, I sense a so that, coming on. What were you surprised about? Well, I mean, I think the reason he made that intervention now and spoke as publicly as he did was because the United States was worried about the trend uh, of debate here. Um, and about that extreme set of circumstances I was talking about before, in which we might conceivably find ourselves out, despite the best wishes of the Prime Minister and others in his party. So, so that's why they're worried. Do you think it's and helpful that, that that sort of signal is sent so publicly from Washington? Because it certainly rubs some British people up the wrong way. I think it is helpful because it reminds people of the big picture. It reminds them that we are, in some senses, diplomatically still in America's pocket. No, I think you get the same message, although they're unlikely to say it publicly, from most of our major international partners. The truth is, as the Prime Minister ended his speech yesterday with this comment, that the more influential that Britain is uh, in Brussels, the more influential it is in Washington, Paris, uh, Washington, Beijing, and, uh, and Delhi, and vice versa. If we lose our influence internationally, we'll have less of it back home. So, so that's the point the Americans were making. Before we end, I want to ask you a little bit more about Obama. You've left Washington now. You can be very frank with me. You were actually very frank about Obama during his campaign for first re election in, in 08. You, uh, an email was leaked in which you talked about not just his high intelligence and his star quality, but also his aloofness and his ability to be insensitive now that we're into it or about to see his second term how do you believe he's handled foreign policy making well his foreign policy making if you look at the public opinion polls has been successful both in america and in uh, Western Europe. Yeah, but I'm Europe. asking you as a foreign policy professional, particularly thinking, for example, of the way he's handled uh, Israel-Palestine, the, the quest for Middle East peace, which I think it's fair to say some in the British Foreign Office haven't been terribly impressed by. Well, I think he tried very hard in his first year, but he came up against uh, an absolute block in the, uh, in the shape of the Israeli Prime Minister, and he wasn't able to get the, um, uh, the movement on settlements, on Israeli settlements in the Palestinian territories. No, there was a showdown, wasn't and there? And I think it. while you were there still, you, you saw President Obama and Netanyahu go head to head on this question of settlement building, and Obama blinked first. Was, well, that a, was that a mistake? Well, ultimately, the Israelis themselves have to agree, and they were not prepared to agree at that time. The, the American administration did not give up. I hope they'll continue in this administration. Do you but think they will? I think they will. Do, but you, I do think you think he'll invest real political capital in I the think, second term in, in trying to bring Israel and the Palestinians I don't think, I don't, to a peace agreement? I don't think he will ignore that, and I think his Secretary of State will, will want to continue with that effort as well. But they've got Iran as well, Stephen, and that's another factor in which I think the Obama administration is handling the issue with caution and care. And trying to put the brakes on Israel. And trying to put the brakes on Israel, and I don't think there's an exact linkage between the two, but the two things are clearly on the table at the same time. And a final thought about the Middle East, because it is so central. You made a big point of saying we had to go into Libya when you were ambassador because there was just urgent humanitarian need with attacks about to happen on, Ga on Benghazi. 60,000 civilian, well, 60,000 people, many of them civilian, have been killed in Syria. Do you not now see the same urgent need for military intervention in Syria? I think the moral case is absolutely the same as you say, if not greater, because at the time we went into uh, Libya, there were a far smaller number of deaths than uh, tragically we've seen in Syria. Mm. But I think it goes back to um, what our Prime Minister and I think what others said at the time we went into Libya. Because we're able to do something um, uh, in Libya doesn't mean we're going to be able to do everything um, elsewhere. Because we can't do everything doesn't mean that we shouldn't do the thing which was then right, before Right, so humanitarian in intervention is not really a universal principle. It's a, it's a universal principle, but it can only be applied if you've With got exceptions. A, fe a, fe no, a feasible way um, of doing it. And Syria was always going to be very difficult from that point of view for a number of reasons. First of all, because the uh, in Libya, you had an enclave which we could protect, a geographical enclave which we could protect. That was not the case in Syria. And principally because Syria had and still has the protection from Iran and from Russia, which prevents United Nations uh, action um, and which makes it very, very difficult for us to take action other than the very strong political action we've taken. Sorry to stop you there, but we have to end. Thank you very much, Sir Nigel Scheinwald, for being on Hard Talk. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nigel.